Helvetia Rocked is a Swiss national association raising awareness about gender inequality in the music industry while supporting, promoting and connecting professional female, inter, non-binary and trans artists. Through its grassroots projects such as producing, DJing, band workshops and songwriting camps, it offers platforms for young people of all levels to discover music and be part of an empowering community. Find out more on our website helvetsiarocked.ch Sign up for the newsletter and follow us on social media. Musicians in Conversation is sponsored by Suiza, the cooperative society of music authors and publishers in Switzerland. Hi everyone, welcome to Helvetia Rocked, Musicians in Conversation. My name is Natalia Anderson and I'm a presenter, content creator and DJ. In this episode of Musicians in Conversation, I'm talking to Anna Murphy, who is a multi-instrumentalist, singer, sound engineer and producer. She's also a coach at the Female Band Workshop. In this episode, we discuss what it was like to leave school at the age of 16 to pursue a music career and how she got into sound engineering and producing. Anna shares a track from her band Cellar Darling and the second track is one she produced for the artist's second daughter. Anna also answers an audience question and don't forget, if you have a question for one of our coaches, simply send a direct message to Helvetia Rocked on Instagram. In the meantime, here's my conversation with Anna Murphy. Hi, this is Anna Murphy and you're listening to Helvetia Rockt, Musicians in Conversation. Hi Anna, how are you? I'm grand, how are you? Very good. I love to hear that I'm grand. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today on Helvetia Rockt, Musicians in Conversation. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to ask you the first question that I ask everyone, and that's how did you get started on your musical journey? Ooh, that's a tough one because it seems like I've always been surrounded by music. Both my parents are opera singers. So basically from the moment I was born, I was just surrounded by singing and classical music and loud noises in general. Yeah, I'm imagining you in the womb, even hearing it from before you were born. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So so it's always been a part of my life. And at one point, I kind of tried to get rid of it. But then the genes just kind of took hold. And I just had to become a musician yeah. somehow. And then when I turned 16, I discovered what is called a hurdy-gurdy. I wanted to ask you about that. That is literally <laughs> one. Of, that's literally the second question <laughs> on my paper here. What is the hurdy-gurdy? It is basically a mechanical violin. It's an old instrument from the medieval times. And there's a wheel you, that you crank and there's strings on the wheel and you play it with keys kind of like an upside down piano it's right. it's it's weird but it sounds really nice and I kind of just fell in love with it and I joined a band right. at 16 um Elveti and so I quit school and that was that since wow. then I've been just doing whatever feels right That's brilliant <laughs> before we get into that so first of all Who introduced you to the hurdy-gurdy or how did you find this instrument? Because it doesn't feel like an instrument that you'd see in a shop window, you know. No, it's definitely not. How did you discover it? I was at a folk festival with my mother and I just saw it and thought, that, I need that. (laughs) Because I've always liked unusual things. Yeah. Do you have to know how to play the violin before you pick up that instrument or the guitar or another stringed instrument or is it something that you could just learn straight away not necessarily you I mean you'd obviously have an advantage if you've played piano or or anything but um no not necessarily because it's it's still completely different in its own way yeah 
So the bands that you joined, Elvati, were they looking for a hurdy gurdy player, or did did you bring that with you? How did that work out? They were looking for a hurdy gurdy player, and and a friend of mine at school told me about it. I had just been playing it three months, and I was renting an instrument from from like a high school for old music, for like baroque music, and I didn't know the band, and I just decided to join. I didn't really think much about it and the thing is they didn't really have any other choices <laughs> so you know they couldn't go with like the best person because I was the only one wow. and then I kind of learned the instrument by learning their songs I'm interested the fact that you joined the band so young you said you were 16 years old what was that decision making process like I'm thinking about the young people who might be listening now. Like it it can be quite a daunting decision to maybe stop the formal education and then take on a musical career. How was it for you making that decision? Absolutely. It it wasn't easy. And and it's not like a lot of people imagine, you know, the the rebel teenager just going, well, f*** school, I'm going to join a band. But that's actually not what it was like because I wanted to finish school I wanted to to get the matura is what you call it here yeah. um, but the school wouldn't allow it I, I asked them if I can go on tour for two weeks and then come back for to write tests and just bring whatever materials with me on tour and they just said it's not possible <sighs> oh, I which which I think that. is I really hope that the school system has made some progress in the meantime yeah because, you know, it's that's not cool, man. <laughs> that's not cool. And when you think about it, two weeks, yeah. that's not a long time. No. And, and so it was a hard decision, but I had such, I have such supportive parents and, you know, that's worth so much because they really supported me with my decision and them being musicians, yeah. they thought, well, you know, she's going to figure it out. And yeah, so I just went with it. Yeah, that's brilliant. I think it makes such a difference to have supportive parents because that was going to be one of my questions, given that they are musicians themselves and they probably know the highs and lows of the industry. Do you Mm -hmm. think they had any reservations about you taking on this decision at such a young age? They, They were happy for me and for the opportunity but they weren't happy about me not having a paper. Yeah. Because they, you know, they went to to university, they studied music. So, you know, it's something that you have in your hands. Yeah. And they as well as I thought, you know, that might be quite risky. Um so I I did things here and there. I continued taking flute lessons and it's not like I didn't do anything except just tour the world and drink beer. Yeah. Uh, I did the <laughs> Which sounds like fun. Yeah. As well. I mean it was a, it was great, but um I did do other things and I did the what's it called the first certificate in English and stuff like that, you know, just to have some yeah. something. But it but it turned out well like now I I'm a producer, I have, I teach, um, and I do all of those things without, without having a diploma. Or, yeah. and, it's, and it's not like I'm saying with this that, you know, don't, don't, everyone. Don't, study, don't, don't study, don't do anything. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is it can work out. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a downside to everything. We all know that. And, you know, with me, it was I... I signed contracts when I was 17, 18 that I didn't read really? and I regret it until today. What? Tell me, can, can <laughs> we go into that a bit? Like, yeah, maybe tell, t- as much as you want to, right? You don't have to talk about like the specifics, but like, how does that work? So you, you, you joined the band and then there's this machine that was presumably already there in, in place. And to be a member of this band, you've got to sign a contract. But what sort of support was there set out for you, if anything? Well, the the main support came from the label. And we've always, with Nuclear Blast, we've always had good and fair deals. Mm. So that's those aren't the contracts I was talking about, oh. even though I probably should have read that one as well. So shame on me. 
But I mean, the basic thing with labels is they give you an advance mm -hmm. so that you can pay for studio and production and whatnot. And then they recoup it by, by selling CDs. Right. That's right, like right. the, you know, the old yeah system yeah that is still i mean it's still done today just not as much yeah because yeah. there's so many bands <laughs> so you know, in that regard we were incredibly lucky but you know a lot of people think that we made a lot of money in those in those 10 years when i was a part of the band and <clears throat> we didn't wow That's and is that because the of the reality of it type of uh deal that it was or the type of um contract It's not really got anything to do with the contract. It's just the the fault, the faulty system that is the music business. Yeah. You know, if you're not Beyonce or Metallica, you're gonna struggle. It's yeah. it's not gonna be a luxurious path. Yeah, yeah. I mean that leads me on to a question that um that I'm asking everybody, which is about how as a musician What are some of the ways that you can make money for you in your own personal experience? I think what is really positive about the development now is that because of, you know, past mistakes of, you know, the entire industry, including musicians, including artists, everybody, a lot of artists want to take over control themselves. They want to have... They want to know where the money goes and, you know, function kind of like like a, a company. And I think that makes so much sense, yeah. especially nowadays. Yeah. And it's definitely a, a smart way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it actually makes a lot of sense because then you, you can see, you know, you get yourself an accountant and, you, you know, money coming in, money mm -hmm. going out, pay your taxes and then you know figure out the rest exactly and it and it's really good if artists are in in full control and they see where the money's going they see what's coming in um yeah it's just it's it's also connected with a lot of hassle because you always you also want to be creative you want to write songs and sometimes the administrative work just gets in the way of that yeah, yeah. so to all those musicians who who can do all of those things at the same time you have my biggest Respect. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. If you are involved in music as a hobby, profession or both, sign up for free on the Helvetia Rocked Music Directory. It's a platform for women, non-binary, trans and intersex people in the Swiss music industry. For singers, instrumentalists, bookers, managers, sound engineers, photographers, and many more of all levels. It's about visibility. It's about community. It's about empowerment. We invite all of you to participate in the project. For further information, go to musicdirectory.ch. You are in a band now called Seller Darling. Beautiful. It reminds me of Celador. Did you? Yes. Is, is it? Yeah. Where did I hear Celador? It's from a movie. It's from a What movie. Is What movie is it? Is it? Is it Donnie Darko? Don, it's Donnie Darko. It's Donnie yes. Darko. Yes. <laughs> no one can test me on my movie trivia. That was impressive. Thank you. I don't know where I drew that from. <laughs> What was it like for you transitioning from Elvetti to Sella Darling? I've always had a like I always had multiple side projects. I could never really be satisfied in just one band. Mm. So I always needed other outlets. And so Seller Darling would have happened eventually even if I wouldn't have split from Elvetti. Yeah. But The split happened and the transition was weird. It was hard because, um, you know, things didn't end well. Right. Even though we get on really well now, but it took some time. Mm. And, you know, with Elveti also my, my, you know, not big, but my small regular salary went as well. Right. So I was kind of stuck with, with nothing 
and I had to move out of my apartment, stay with my parents for a while. So that was a really, really hard transition. Yeah. But it also gave us some some food to write songs and put all of our energy into that. And yeah, so it was hard, but it was also a really important step. And I'm really happy. Yeah that I made that step. Mm. Well, let's take this time to listen to your first track that you've provided for us. It's called Dance. It's your it's from your band Seller Darling. Can you tell us a bit about the song Dance? How did you arrive at this uh, song? What what is it about? Well, it's very long and that's why you're going to shorten it. Yes. Um, <laughs> I started writing that song about two years ago so it's been in the making really long and it was supposed to be on our last concept album and it just didn't make the cut but I always I couldn't really give up on it so I just decided to dig it out and just try again and and it's a really special song because usually I'm the kind of person who just goes with the first intuition the gut and I write a song and I just that's the song. Yeah. Like, I don't think, is this chorus good enough? Or should I add another verse? Or blah, blah, blah. I just, this is the f***ing song. You know, take it or leave it. Yeah. And this is the first song where there's so many versions, so many revisions. And I'm really happy with it. So I've kind of, with this song, I realized that, you know, revisions and redoing and rewriting can be a really amazing process as well the song is about uh, the dancing plague of 1518 which i don't know about the dancing plague it was a really weird moment in time where people in strasbourg strasbourg they took to the streets and just started dancing uncontrollably for days a lot of them died whoa (laughs) yeah it was really it's such a weird moment in history And there's different theories as to why that happened. And theories go from food poisoning, you know, that they ate some mushrooms with with hallucinogenic whatever. And there's another one that it's basically uh, the power of suggestion. You know, just one person starts doing something and just everybody joins in. They don't know why. But the most, the theory that makes the most sense is kind of a combination of power of suggestion and people were just poor they had no food uh the church had all the money and it was a kind of protest as well in a sense and i just found it really fascinating i read a book about it um yeah so it's basically kind of like a dance of death uh kind of song yeah let's listen to it this is dance Turns out the silence and freeze the round in circles do the toward one stance. Cara Cara 
in 2011, you became an independent sound engineer and producer. I feel so happy to be in the company of somebody who's a sound engineer and a producer, but also as a woman who's doing that. How did you get into sound engineering? If you want to, get as technical as you can, because I want really uh, to inspire more women into this career path. So Mm -hmm. what was it for you? Yeah, that's definitely something that I want to do as well. Brilliant. So... It started because I wanted to write my own demos at home. The first thing that I did was I recorded vocals onto like a mini disc. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, what <laughs> What the hell? I can't even imagine doing that anymore. Um, you got to start somewhere. You got to start thing. somewhere. And then that didn't really satisfy me anymore. Yeah. Um, And I think I started around a time, you know, where it got much easier to do home producing. There were these little interfaces and all you needed was a microphone, an audio interface and a computer. That's it. Amazing times. So I started doing that with uh, Logic. I didn't know what I was doing. I could record and that was it. I wrote my songs with a little MIDI keyboard yeah. and I was amazed. And uh, the first production I ever did was actually the solo project of Mary Tadic, who was the violin player in Elveti at the time. And she recorded everything herself, wrote everything herself, and she just needed someone to mix it. Um, I think she even checked out a couple of options that she wasn't happy with. And so I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mix it. So she, sure. when you say checked out other options, like she used other people? Yeah. Okay. And she wasn't happy with what they were doing. So I ended up mixing her first EP. I had no clue what I was doing. Really? Were you just going by what you could hear, what sounded right? Exactly. And playing around with yeah. that. Yeah. And and honestly, I kind of miss those times because it was so in you know, in a way so like this this childlike joy. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would just sit there with, with and I just used the, the logic yeah. plugins. Right. And I was amazed. Like reverb. Wow. And then I would put reverb on the different things. And she would also be like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it up. <laughs> and and yeah, that's I got really, um, really interested in, in that stuff. And then I, I came in contact with Marco Iancarelli at the sound farm where I, where I still work uh, today and he's the the best friend of my uncle so that's how that connection happened and I could just check out the studio and and he actually immediately offered me to to start working there as kind of like an uh, an apprentice so I started out just making you know coffee and setting up microphones and doing whatever that he could trust me with at the time so it was really just the the classic learn by doing yeah. method absolutely yeah how did you feel because I always whenever I go into a studio and you see this huge mixing desk how do you not feel daunted by the sight of all those knobs and faders and buttons I mean it, it still blows my mind I'll look at a mixing desk and go oh, I'm not gonna I can't even bother with that <laughs> I can't wrap my head around that and, and and you know when you're using like an interface and you're using logic it's based on what is already in a proper you know your traditional studio but how do you bridge that gap from what you can do on your own in the computer and then being faced with a real desk the the funny thing is you've already answered your your Have own I? question because <laughs> and I was the same because I I work uh, just digitally yeah I don't have a mixing desk uh and and that's how I learned it and the first time that I was gonna work with a a huge console um at a different studio I I had the same thing I was like oh my god how am I gonna do this I didn't go to the school and I should have learned this and blah, blah, blah. and you know basically it's the you would probably know how the desk works because it's already what you're doing with the audio interface yeah. and the 
the little mixer that you have in Logic. Yeah. You know, it's not that different. Wow. Of course, there's some, you know, yeah, some elements that you'd have to look into, but you know, it's it's really self-explanatory mm. if you've worked in the in the digital yeah audio world. I love that. Because the fact is, and, and, and in us having this conversation, we've already said we want to encourage more women to pursue this as a career. So the fact that, you know, first thing, using your intuition, like using your ears, n- knowing what you like the sound of is, is per- perhaps the first step. Mm-hmm. And then maybe the second step, just familiarizing yourself with what's available. So like your whatever's on your laptop there and just sort of playing around and pushing that reverb. Give us some more <laughs> reverb. <Yeah. in> there. <laughs> <laughs> and then knowing from there, to, you you can sort of have the foundation, isn't it? To be able to look at a proper mixing console like in real life. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, the first time I worked with the console, I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that, that it's, it makes sense. It's not hard. It's it's really weird. Yeah, we. I think it's good, you know, to have uh, a certain amount of respect for the, you know, the technicalities and, and also, you know, not, not making things too easy. But you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's also it it's a great job to just kind of dive into and see and see what happens mm-hmm. and even though i've been doing this job so many years of course there's going to be days where i think mm, you know my technical knowledge is not where this other person's technical knowledge yeah, is yeah. this person who went to sia or whatever but, you know, who cares? Mm. Because the most important thing when working in a studio is that you can capture the best performance. Yes. And that you can work with a musician. So probably 50% or more of that job is psychological. Yes. Because you can have the best, you know, Neve console from, I don't know, from the 70s or whatever. <laughs> but if you can't, capture the magical moment of a song or you can give whatever support the musicians need you know that neve desk is isn't going to do you any good um what's your favorite way to get another take from from an artist do you go that's great let's just get it one more time for uh for good luck (laughs) that is such a important and interesting question because it really depends on the musician you're working with and that's what I was saying before about the psychological aspect. Some musicians, they really need you to tiptoe around them and, you know, be their their mother or their wow. sister or, you yeah. know, whatever. Some need you to be harsh. Some just need the brutal, honest truth. How do you... No. Do you have a discussion with them beforehand? You know, do you say, what do you need from me? Like, or, or how do you take direction? Or do you sort of figure it out as, you, as you're with them? I usually just sort of figure it out as we go. Mm. But what needs to be talked about beforehand is if I'm just, just, I don't mean that um, disrespectful, or no when I say just I don't mean it as in that it's less important but just engineer Mm -hmm. or am I the producer because those are two very different things if a band or a or a musician hires me as an engineer I'm gonna have less creative input than if I'm producing it if I'm producing it I really have to be able to be comfortable that this is that my name is on the production and there's more personal involvement so th- those are the things I like to just get out of the way yeah. before we start do you think the fact that you've had so many years of experience being an artist yourself and you continue to make music does, has that helped you to be on the other side and sort of understand what what the artists need from you I would say definitely because I know what it's like if you write a song and it's your baby and you're just 
you know, kind of, you're still keeping it, but you're kind of giving it away. Yeah. And I know how terrifying that can be because the vision that you have in your head, you know, it's impossible for somebody else to to feel or see it the exact same way. Yeah. So I have the the utmost respect when people trust me yeah. with their music and I just do everything to to make it like they envision it which isn't so easy because sometimes I want to make something better but still making something better that is just my perception you yeah. know it's it's still a matter of taste so being a producer is also very I struggle with it sometimes because mm. You know, in a way, you need to be confident that you're making the right decisions. But in the end, you know, music is so, so random. So random so, and it's almost so subjective as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, let's just go to the audience question. Right, this question is from Sand Sandra. And she says, how do you discuss payment do you have and in brackets any guidelines any personal guidelines yeah for you what's what's been your experiences in discussing payments maybe more so with seller darling than than with your previous band hmm. well i could make a joke and just say what payment <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but no. I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's not that much of a joke, to be honest. Um, yeah, sadly. Because, you know, we haven't been going that long. The band is very young. So, but the way we work, we are kind of like a family business, yeah. which is really nice. Our drummer is also the manager. Uh, I write most of the music with our guitar player and we, we want to kind of handle everything ourselves and, and keep it in the band. So our drummer, Merlin, does most of the... No, he doesn't do... He does all the negotiating. I've never negotiated in my life. So that's kind of his job. Right, and yeah. I mean, how do we handle payment? We just... We, we get an offer. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's not enough, we... <laughs> we discuss it but you know most of the time we just want to play and we yeah. just kind of make it work yeah. but at this stage we've been going I don't know six uh, four years I mean I've never earned money from a show because you know we we pay for front of house we need a session bass player we need to get to the show somehow yeah. with the van uh, oh. or you know flights and whatever so I've so far I've only earned money with culture funding and with Suiza yeah right yes. so it's still but I mean that is you know in general you say it takes about five years or so until mm -hmm. you 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 know start seeing something but I mean it's different with every band like I don't want to make it sound like musicians don't earn money that's not you know that's not what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. At least in our genre, touring is the most important thing you can do because of selling merch. Right. Because people coming to shows and actually paying to see live music are important and they, they want to support bands. Yeah. So that is, that is essentially how we finance our tours as well, apart from culture funding, yeah. is selling merch. So this will take us to the end of our conversation. Anna, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks for having me. I hope there was some knowledge in there. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So you are going to introduce your second song. What is that? The song is called Stell Up. And it's by an artist. She's really amazing. She's called Second Daughter. And I'm producing her, well, co-producing, because she's she's one of those artists that her creativity is, it seems like it's just endless. Wow. She's always creating and she has so much output and does everything herself with Reaper. 
and um, I'm always amazed that she trusts me with her with her amazing music so that's why I chose that song we produced that together a couple of months ago and now we're working on her EP amazing yeah. well, here it is here's Stell Ab Deadlines dröne dem Gang Tasche singe dem Tag Stell mal ab Alle trinken das Glas Vernetzen sich an der Bar Still mal ab. Von Meeting zu Meeting wie Spar, die Hain oder Busch, die Gang, still mal ab. Weiter und weiter und weiter, besser und besser und besser, still nicht ab. Alle Sorgen. Gut versorge dir klar. Du kannst alles erreichen, dein Traum. Schau dich an und flieg, und flieg. Join the Helvetia Rocked community or find out more, check out the website, sign up for the newsletter and follow us on social media. And if you like what you've heard today, please share it with your friends. Musicians in Conversation is a concept by Natalia Anderson in collaboration with Helvetia Rocked. It's presented and produced by Natalia Anderson. Music is by Jesse Quartz.